Chapter 28 We've had the warrant approved to search Marcus Waiton's apartment. Bianca barked before Emmett even had time to make it through the doorway. Building management have a key, so I've sent Williams out to get it from their head office. Great. Emmett placed his bag on a spare seat and joined his team at the table in the conference room. He looked from the open laptops to the sheets of paper bundled in folders. How's it going otherwise? Ted rubbed his chin. We're getting quite a good response to this morning's press conference. Lots of tips into the hotline. Carter and I are following up any leads. Names? Plenty of people believe they recognise the man in the footage, but the problem is all the identities are different. And so far, there's no one that matches anyone in our database. We're about to start doing a ring around to try and eliminate people. Has Marcus's name come up? No. Ted ran a finger down a handwritten page of notes. But keep in mind, most people are only just getting home from work about now and may not have even seen the news yet. True. Emmett drummed his fingers on the table. What about the background checks? He's not in the system, Bianca said, still tapping away furiously at her keyboard. I've made the usual inquiries, but haven't gotten anything yet. And nothing further on Abby Knowles? Nothing at all. Bianca's eyes darted to her homicide colleague, the pair clearly sharing a similar misgiving. What is it? Emmett pressed. Ted lowered his head. Bianca twisted her mouth. Are you sure that this woman has something to do with our murder investigation? She finally asked. I mean, she's not even the same profile as the other victims. She's a good ten years younger than both Rosemary and Natalie, and she's got no known connection to the nursing home, which is where all the evidence has been leading us. Emmett clamped his lips. Follow the evidence. He heard her words ringing in his ears. But that's exactly what he was doing. You don't think a second woman going missing from DGP finance is a lead worth pursuing? His cheeks flushed. Or the fact that a colleague of both Rosemary Norman and Abby Knowles has identified Marcus Wayton as potentially being the man in the nursing home footage. Bianca's nostrils flared, but her tone softened. I'm just worried we're wasting precious resources and time on someone who might have simply decided to get away for a few days. Emmett opened his mouth to continue, but was interrupted by a furious buzzing. Sorry. Stephen clumsily reached for his phone, swiping at it like it was a wasp, and only managing to knock it further across the table just out of his reach. Emmett grabbed it and answered the unknown number on his colleague's behalf. This is Stephen Carter's phone. Sorry, who is this? The shock must have been obvious in his voice, because he became acutely aware of all eyes suddenly upon him. Oh, hello, Mr. Waiton. Thanks for calling us back. At the West Melbourne headquarters? Yes, that would be great. See you soon. After he hung up, his team sat in stunned silence until Bianca could no longer contain her glee. So Marcus Waiton isn't hiding from us then, she teased. He claims to have been in meetings all day, Emmett muttered as he headed for the door, nausea building in his stomach but he'll be here in about half an hour. Let's see what he has to say for himself then. The cafe was closing up, so Cindy bought three hot chocolates in takeaway cups and led Nicholas and Jordan to the waterfront. The boys chatted happily between themselves, leaving her to mull over her own worries. Behind the Balti Bridge, the sun was setting 
the last hint of its light reflecting in golden rivers on the water below. What a dramatic day. Cindy sipped her drink. She didn't want to think about what the weeks ahead would involve. The empty hours alone at home, the restless nights. But her memories of the immediate past were not much better. Are you sure there are marshmallows in here? Jordan prodded the contents of his cup with the end of his plastic spoon. They're under the foam, Nicholas answered wisely, licking his lips. Cindy turned to the boys. Jordan, would you mind if we deleted those photos that you showed me? The teenager's eyes widened, his body hunching forward so that his back arched, reminding her of a frightened cat. You want me to delete my trains? No, not your trains. Cindy shook her head. But could we get rid of those pictures of the angry man? I'd prefer no one else saw them. Jordan frowned, a hand protectively hovering over his jacket pocket where his phone was kept. Then he shrugged. I suppose so, he said, passing her the phone. Cindy flicked through the photo gallery, her heart again pounding as she saw his pictures. Jordan hadn't captured the killer in action. He'd photographed her, with Michael. She scowled as she looked at the images. There they were, walking aimlessly along the bike path, admiring the view back over the Docklands and huddled together under the freeway. The one that upset her the most showed her perched on a concrete pylon, trying to photograph the herons. She was staring straight ahead, while Michael's arm was wrapping itself around her waist. Like a python, about to strike. It was confronting to see the two of them as an outsider might. So mismatched. So wrong. After deleting them all, and triple-checking there weren't any more, Cindy passed the phone back to Jordan. Do you want to photograph trains with me tomorrow? He asked. I don't think I'll be in tomorrow. In fact, I probably won't be back for quite a while. Cindy smiled sadly, realising she might never see Jordan again. But I promise I'll keep an eye out for you the next time I'm here. Jordan looked to the water, his face fixed in concentration as he slurped the last of his hot chocolate. I love trains, he eventually whispered. When Marcus Waiton arrived at the station headquarters, Emmett watched Bianca reluctantly shake hands. The man oozed sleaze, carrying his suit jacket ridiculously over one shoulder, his mouth set in a permanent smirk. Thank you for coming in so promptly. Emmett led the way to a spare interview room, where he sat beside his colleague at a small table and assessed the man opposite. Marcus appeared to be aged in his early 40s, with dark brown hair and a thin build. But was he the man in the footage? Emmett frowned. He certainly could be. So, what's all this about? Marcus crossed one leg dramatically over the other, leaning back in the plastic chair. The voice message said it was something to do with Abby Knowles, the intern at my office? That's right. Emmett's nose twitched as a heavy waft of cologne drifted across the table. I understand the two of you were dating. Huh, <laughs> dating? Marcus scoffed. Hardly. Well, how would you describe it? Emmett sighed. We hooked up once, but it was a mistake. Nothing more to it. A mistake? How so? We went out. There were a few of us in a group, and everyone had a few too many drinks. 
She threw herself at me, and I foolishly went home with her. What night was this? Last Friday. Just four days ago? Yes, but I haven't spoken to her since. Really? Emmett pressed. Even though you worked in the same office. I managed to avoid her. How good of you, Bianca muttered, just loud enough to be heard. Marcus sneered, undoing a cufflink as he settled back further in the chair. I can do a lot better than women like Abby Knowles, believe me. Regardless, Emmett cut in, determined to keep the conversation on track. You say you went home with her on the Friday evening. Was that to her place or yours? Hers. And you left on the Saturday? As early as I could. Was her son there as well? What? Marcus looked genuinely perplexed. She has a son? Yes. He shook his head. I had no idea. He wasn't there? No. And what happened on the Monday, when you were both at work? Did she try to speak with you? Of course. The trademark smirk returned as Marcus stroked his chin. She'd been messaging me non-stop all weekend too. I couldn't get rid of her. When was the last time you heard from her? Marcus pulled out his phone theatrically swiping his fingers across the screen to unlock it. It was late last night, he murmured, scrolling through text messages. There you go. He pushed the phone across the table. Emmett and Bianca both leant in. Are you home? I have a little surprise for you. Emmett frowned, looking from his colleague back to Marcus. What did that mean? And you didn't respond? Of course not. You weren't interested in what this surprise might be? Hardly. She didn't turn up at your place? How could she? She didn't even know my address. There was a knock at the door. As Bianca went to attend to it, Marcus leaned towards Emmett. Listen, are you going to tell me what all this is about? Is Abby accusing me of something? Because it'll be lies, whatever she's saying. Don't listen to a word of it. No, she's not accusing you of anything. Emmett paused, stopping to read the slip of paper that his colleague had just passed him. Nothing significant found in the search of Marcus's place. Stephen's jagged handwriting read, Emmett sank in his chair. Why couldn't he catch a break? Do you have someone who can verify your whereabouts last night? And today? He forced himself to remain composed. Absolutely. Marcus's grin widened. I had a mate drinking with me at home most of last night, and today I've been in back-to-back -back meetings. I'll get you the details. Terrific, Emmett muttered. His investigation was going nowhere.